I've been practicing. Bess, on the other hand, seemed a bit disappointed. I was sure you'd have something more elaborate up your sleeve. That wasn't even a ruse. I shrug. Sometimes the best con is as simple as looking like you belong. Anyway, let's see where this leads. We were standing at the top of a stairwell. It was dark and cool. Without a word, we lit up our phones like flashlights and headed down the steps. As we descended, it became increasingly clear that this part of the hotel was never supposed to be seen by guests. The paint on the walls was chipping and the stairs creaked under our feet. While the lobby and guest rooms had felt old in a charming way, this space was just decrepit. The staircase led down to a large basement. Stacks of old furniture and room service carts lined the walls and crowded the floor. Eek! Bess screeched. Startled, George grabbed my arm, her nails digging into my skin. What? What is it? Bess didn't answer. I followed her gaze to a ghostly figure looming over us. An eerie moaning sound wafted through the basement, and we quickly grabbed hands. It's coming our way. George hissed. I nodded, but then I looked closer. It's moving, but I'm not sure it's moving toward us. I took a step forward and cautiously reached out my hand, stealing myself. As soon as my fingers brushed our phantom, I couldn't help letting out a chuckle. It's not a ghost. It's just a sheet draped over discarded furniture. Here, watch. I yanked on the fabric, revealing a coat stand sitting on top of a desk. Sorry, Bess said sheepishly. I don't know why I freaked out. It's okay, I said, giving her a reassuring smile. We're all on edge, and it did look pretty scary. I still hear moaning, George whispered. I paused, listening. It sounds like it's coming from that direction. I pointed toward the far side of the room. Bess leaned forward. I think I see light coming from there, too. It's probably a door. I took a determined step toward the corner. I bet that's how the woman took my dad out of the hotel. Maneuvering through the stacks of discarded furniture, Bess, George, and I picked a path through the clutter. Some of the piles nearly brushed the ceiling. They creaked and swayed as we shimmied past. This is like a furniture graveyard. George muttered. I was thinking it was like a furniture version of those hedge mazes you find in fancy gardens, I said, as my hand brushed a chair with only three legs. Do you think they redecorated the rooms but kept all the old stuff just in case they changed their minds? Bess asked, wrinkling her nose. Before I could respond, there was a clatter behind us. George yelped. What was that? I demanded my eyes darting around the room. Nothing, George said. Just hit my shin on what I think might have once been a luggage rack. My foot made contact with something, sending it skittering across the floor. The beam of my camera light caught the object just as it slid under a narrow gap beneath a dresser piled high with TVs and ottomans. I think that was a phone, I said. What if it's my dad's? That's a big leap, Nancy. George said. It could have been anything. And even if it is a phone, it's way more likely to belong to one of the hotel employees. And that very tall pile of very heavy furniture looks like it might topple over at the smallest nudge. She added, grabbing my elbow as I made to rush over to the dresser for a closer look. The Find My Phone app said Dad's phone was in the hotel, even after he went missing. This could explain it, I insisted. George took a breath about to answer, but Bess interrupted before she could say anything. George, what's gotten into you? You know if there's any chance that the object could be Mr. Drew's phone, we have to check. You're right, I'm sorry, George shuddered. This basement just creeps me out. Step back, I instructed, before lying down on the ground and sliding my arm under the dresser. Careful, Bess warned. Dust tickled at my nose. I held my breath, fighting as hard as I could, but the sneeze exploded out of me. An ominous groaning sounded above me as the TVs swayed. I heard Bess gasp and I clenched my eyes shut, 
sure that the junk pile was about to come crashing down on my back. After a moment, the pile settled, and I let out a sigh of relief before slowly sweeping my arm back and forth through the grime, feeling for the phone's plastic case. I can't reach it. Let me guide you, George said. She lay down at the end of the dresser and shined her phone's light at the shadows. Okay, Nance, more to your right. I slid my arm as directed, but I didn't feel anything. You're so close, just a little more. I stretched my arm, extending my fingers as far as they would go. George shifted her position, sending up another cloud of dust. A little farther. Come on, Nancy, Bess urged. You can do it. The tips of my fingers brushed the plastic edge, but I couldn't get enough purchase to grab hold of it and drag it out. Finally, I pulled my arm out with a sigh. I can't reach. Wait, Bess shot to attention. I have an idea. She quickly but carefully wound her way back through the maze of clutter. I heard clanging mixed with unintelligible grunts and muttering. Bess, what are you doing? Hang on. There was more clanging, then the sound of fabric being torn. Moments later, Bess returned, sweaty, her hair a mess, but she was smiling. She triumphantly held up a metal pole bent at one end. I thought we could use this as a hook. George sat up, squinting at the pole. Is that the leg of a luggage rack? Yep, I remembered you said you ran into one. Bess, you're a genius. I said as I took the pole and slid it under the dresser. Let's try again, George said. Back and to the right. I feel like I'm playing one of those claw games. You know, the ones where you try to grab a stuffed animal, but it always slips away just as the claw rises up again. Don't say that, Bess scolded. Those things are impossible. I felt the pole make contact with the object. Got it, I called out. Carefully, I guided the mystery object back toward me, raising it in the air as I sat up. And guys, I'm pretty sure this is Dad's phone. I was covered head to toe in dust, but at least I'd gotten my prize. George and Bess crowded around me as I bent over the screen, tapping to wake up the phone. The battery was at a measly 3%. Do you know your dad's password? George asked. Of course. I entered the numbers without even thinking, but instead of dad's home screen, the screen filled with his notes app. Nancy, 16. 16, what does that mean? Bess asked. I racked my brain before deflating at the truth. <sighs> I have no idea. Chapter five, a new twist. Phone recovered, we turned our attention back to the door, which opened into a rear alley. Following the narrow passage, we found ourselves across the street from a parklet with a bench that wrapped around a tree. I took a deep lungful of fresh air as we plopped down. It felt good to be out of that dark, dusty, overcrowded basement. After taking in a few more deep breaths, I turned my attention back to the screen of Dad's phone. 16. What was he trying to tell me? It has to be some kind of riddle. You and your dad do love puzzles, Bess said. It's true. Dad had me helping him solve crossword puzzles and Sudoku games as soon as I could read. One year, we'd even gone on vacation to a swanky resort in upstate New York that included guest talks from puzzle experts, afternoon board game tournaments, and a scavenger hunt that lasted all weekend. It had been one of my favorite trips. If this were a puzzle, the 16 wouldn't be literal. It would be standing in for something else. Let's brainstorm. Do you think Dad meant us to connect the 16 to Washington, D.C. in some way? I asked. I got up from the bench and started pacing. I always think better when I pace. The White House is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, George said. True, I said, not bothering to pause. But it's pretty unlikely that she was escorting him to dinner with the president. 
There's a 16th Street here in D.C., Bess said, looking up from her phone. Maybe he figured out they were going there. Maybe, I said, but it felt off. When you're doing a puzzle, whether it's a crossword or trying to break out of an escape room, there's a moment where everything clicks into place and you know that you and the puzzle maker are on the same wavelength. I know how my dad's brain works. He's a precise person. He wouldn't send us on a wild goose chase, poking around an entire street. Even in a rush, even under pressure, he would have come up with a clue that would lead me exactly where I needed to go. Let's keep thinking, I said. 16, 16, you get your driver's license at 16. Is there a car museum in DC? Let me check, George said as she whipped out her phone. No car museum. There is a car collection at the Museum of American History though. That's a possibility, but it still didn't feel right. There are 16 ounces in a pound, Bess offered. George kept scrolling. Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president. I looked at her, eyes wide. That's it, I squawked. The Lincoln Memorial, it's on the National Mall. I knew that was where dad wanted us to go, just like I know when a word will fit perfectly into the black and white grid of the crossword puzzle without even having to count the number of letters. 20 minutes later, we were racing up the same steps where Martin Luther King Jr. had delivered his I Have a Dream speech, but I was so focused on finding my dad, I didn't really have time to take in the significance of the moment. I wasn't naive enough to think that my dad would still be at the memorial. He'd left the note on his phone almost a day ago. But I hoped that even if we didn't find dad there, we'd find another clue. But all the thoughts racing through my mind evaporated as I stared up at the enormous statue of President Lincoln sitting ramrod straight in his chair, staring down at the country he'd shepherded over 150 years ago. His eyes looked sad, but patient. I had seen photos of the memorial in my history textbooks, but I wasn't prepared for how big it was or how awe-inspiring it would be. Tourists swarmed around us, jostling for the best place to take their selfies. Small children shrieked, delighted by how their voices echoed. Bye! But as I gazed up at Lincoln's face, the pandemonium...